Part One of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart by Herbert F. Peiser. Part One. Preface mozart's earthly career was so poignantly short yet so filled with incalculable achievement that the author of this booklet finds himself confronted with an impossible task he has consequently preferred to outline as best he could in the space at his disposal a few successive details of a life that was amazingly crowded with incident early triumphs and subsequent crushing tragedies rather than to consider let alone evaluate the staggering creative abundance the master bequeathed mankind it is scarcely necessary to disclaim for this thumbnail sketch any new slant or original illumination if it moves any reader to renew his acquaintance with the standard biographies of the composer or better still to deepen his artistic enrichment by a study of modern interpretations of contemporary mozart scholars like alfred einstein and bernard Paumgartner, its object will be more than achieved beginning if the mozartian family tree was nothing like the prodigious trunk of the box it was still not without striking features there were mozarts in south germany as far back as the end of the sixteenth century and as remotely as the thirteenth the name stood on a document in cologne to be sure various spellings of mozart existed in those distant times it appeared as mosshard mozart mozart and in still other variants bernard paumgartner director of the salzburg mozarteum thinks it derived from the old german root mod or mut from which came the word mut courage be this as it may german mozarts were anything but exceptional a couple of hundred years before leopold mozart or his son wolfgang came into the picture in augsburg there was an anton mozart who painted landscapes in the manner of bruegel another mozart from the same town one johann michael was a sculptor who in sixteen eighty seven moved to vienna and became an austrian citizen but of all these mosshards motards and the rest only one the mason apprentice david mozart born in the village of fersi close to augsburg really belongs to our story the augsburger bürgerbuch of sixteen forty three mentions him and sets his fortune at one hundred florins by his marriage with the jungfer maria nageler he was to become the great-great-grandfather of the creator of don giovanni in the fullness of time david's grandson johann georg abandoned the occupation of his forebears for that of a bookbinder his second wife blessed him with two daughters and six sons one of these sons franz alois gained a kind of immortality as the father of maria anna tekla wolfgang's cousin the basil to whom he wrote that series of notoriously smutty letters with which this lively young lady's name is eternally linked johann georg's first-born johann georg leopold became for posterity simply leopold mozart composer of arid music author of a celebrated violin method and father of wolfgang and of maria anna walpurga ignacia whom the world remembers almost solely as nannerl it is nannerl incidentally that we have to look for a sort of continuation of the mozart line down almost to our own time on january ninth nineteen nineteen there died in the feldhof insane asylum near graz the seventy-seven year old berta forster a great-granddaughter of nannerl who had lived on in salzburg till eighteen twenty nine highly revered because of her exalted kinship early life in salzburg what brought leopold mozart to salzburg in the first place a choir singer in the augsburg church of st ulrich and a graduate of the augsburger jesuit lyceum he seemed to be shaping for a priestly career 
He did not, at all events, follow the bookbinder's trade like his brothers. Alfred Einstein finds it difficult to grasp why he should have preferred Salzburg to Munich or Ingolstadt for an orthodox theological education. Possibly a suggestion of the canons of St. Ulrich had something to do with it. Whatever the reason, he enrolled at the university in the town of the Salzach, July twenty second, seventeen thirty eight. There he studied philosophy, logic, and music, understood Latin, composed passion cantatas and instrumental works, acquired some proficiency on the violin, and obtained a smattering of legal knowledge. Five years later he became fourth violinist in the court orchestra of the archbishop, but he maintained his close family connections with Augsburg, and later encouraged his son not to relax these ties. It is not quite certain when he met Anna Maria Pertl, whose father was superintendent of a clerical institution at St. Gilgen on the nearby Wolfgang See. In the fall of 1772 he wrote her from Milan, it was twenty-five years ago, I think, that we had the sensible idea of getting married, one which we had cherished for many years. All good things take time. Anna Maria was her husband's junior by a year. Jan questions if she rose in any way above the average woman of her type. A good provincial, she had not the suspicious, mistrustful qualities of Leopold. She lacked intellectual depth, but she was a good wife and affectionate mother, a genuinely lovable creature, a receptacle of all the community gossip and local tittle-tattle. She judged with an eye just as friendly as her husband's was critical and sarcastic. And from his mother, Wolfgang inherited his gaiety and some of his more incorrigible Hanswurst characteristics. Though the Mozart couple had seven children, only two of these survived infancy, Nannerl the fourth and her great brother who came last. Wolfgang was born on January twenty seventh, seventeen fifty six, at eight o'clock in the evening, in the house belonging to Lorenz Hagenauer, on the narrow Getreide Gaza, Salzburg. The very next morning the newcomer, whose birth came near costing the mother's life, was carried to church and baptized with the name Johannes Chrysostomus Wolfgangus Theophilus, the last in honor of his godfather, Johann Theophilus Pergmeier. Subsequently the Greek Theophilus was changed to its more euphonious Latin equivalent, Amadeus. Wolfgang, like the other Mozart children, was at first nourished with water instead of milk, according to a preposterous superstition of the time. We have to thank the good health of the infant that he did not succumb, as did most of the other Mozart offspring, and even withstood later illnesses. A sensitive and affectionate lad, Wolfgang, was extraordinarily devoted to his parents, especially to his father, despite Leopold's humorless and obstinate nature. "'Next to God comes Papa,' was a childhood expression of the boy." To be sure, the inflexible Martinet commanded a certain respect by reason of his very genuine love for his family and his determination to rear his children according to what he considered their best interests. But he seemed unable to rise above his middle-class prejudices, and, when all is said, his attitude toward his son was like that of a conventional Victorian father who guided the footsteps of his son according to his lights, yet refused to permit him any freedom, whatever, for explorations of his own. All the same, Leopold could be self-sacrificing in the interest of his children, and therein lay one of the saving features of an unlovable character. It was one of his merits to have perceived at once the musical predispositions of his children, to have cultivated them, even to have grasped early the most advantageous ways of exploiting them. Nannerl was by no means slow in showing uncommon aptitude for music, and Leopold lost no time in embarking upon her training. Wolfgang, in his cradle, listened to his sister's lessons in the adjoining room, 
and we can only surmise what mystical instincts vibrated in the childish consciousness he was hardly more than three when these impelled him to the keyboard there to search for consonant intervals and to shout with delight when he discovered and sounded thirds he had an abnormally refined and sensitive hearing was distressed by impurities of pitch and perturbed by any violence of sound who does not remember the story of the child mozart fainting on hearing the tone of a trumpet we are told that he was very soon able to play light piano pieces without any signs of effort and to memorize and perform them without notes cleanly and in perfect time in less than half an hour nor was the violin unfamiliar to him and though he is not supposed to have started his studies on that instrument till his sixth year nissen tells that a certain herr von Moer heard wolfgang play the violin at four leopold mozart's chief trouble lay not in making his son practice but in getting him away from the piano music occupied his waking hours almost exclusively and for the customary games and amusements of childhood the boy showed little interest or if it was a question of fun it had to be in some way associated with music before putting him to bed in the evening his father would stand him on a chair to give him a good-night kiss whereupon the child would declaim italian nonsense syllables like organia figastafa and such to some scrap of folk tune as if imitating an opera singer then he would return his father's caresses kissing him on the tip of his nose and promising when he grew up to enclose him in a capsule and carry him about at all times in later years leopold reminisced in a letter to his son when you sat at the piano or otherwise occupied yourself with music nobody was allowed to joke with you in any way indeed the expression on your face would become so serious that many struck by what they considered your prematurely ripened talent feared that your life might be short fears that were to be only too well founded and when barely six he stubbornly refused to play before any audience that did not include at least one musically cultured listener abraham mendelssohn used to say that whereas he had once been famous as the son of his father he was now celebrated as the father of his son leopold mozart was most indisputably the father of his son his juiceless compositions his violin method and the rest of his dreary talents and moral virtues have a kind of museum value only as they contributed to wolfgang's artistic upbringing and guidance alfred einstein observes that the first signs of musical talent in wolfgang completely changed the direction of leopold's life and thought unquestionably it was better so and in the long run he was far more richly rewarded for cultivating the fruitful soil committed to his tillage systematic piano instruction was the first thing on which he seems to have concentrated composition was a by-product wolfgang improved unceasingly which meant that numerous minuets and simple pieces of various types took shape under his fingers the father writing down industriously what his son's fancy dictated nannerl extemporized no less actively leopold spurred his children by acquainting them with short works by himself and recognized musicians to divert them after dry technical exercises each had a little study book of pieces the one that wolfgang received from his father on october thirty one seventeen sixty two has come down to us complete and contains a hundred and thirty-five examples for study among them wolfgang tried his hand at brief works of his own in the father's writing we can read the following de wolfgango mozart may eleventh seventeen sixty two und juli sixteen seventeen sixty two some of the masters given the boy to study were wagenseil telemann haas and philipp emanuel bach wolfgang's compositions include an innocent minuet and trio with very simple basses and a little allegro and three-part song form in these and other childish efforts the improving hand of leopold can be repeatedly detected 
it was to be so for some time to come and when the father did not have a correcting finger in the pie we become aware of it it is evident in a sketch-book wolfgang was given in london a year or two later when leopold fell ill and in order not to be disturbed by the sounds of practising asked the boy to write something and refrain from noise the book is filled with a great variety of minuets contradances rondos gigues sicilianos preludes and even an unfinished sketch for a fugue here one sees indisputable genius in conflict with technical lapses and other evidences of inexperience that somewhat modify the notion that wolfgang had acquired all his skill by instinct rather than by carefully disciplined study first visit to vienna the five-year-older nannerl being a remarkable clavier performer and wolfgang absorbing his father's instructions with the utmost facility leopold was not long in deciding that he might profitably bring his pair of prodigies before the public and make them known in aristocratic circles where he had a good chance of capitalizing on their talents besides there were new artistic currents astir in the world to which the boy in particular might be exposed to his advantage if ever i knew how priceless time is for youth i know it now and you know that my children are used to work he wrote to h hagenauer insisting he had no idea of permitting the youngsters to fall into habits of idleness he seems to have given little thought to the strain of travel especially since the children were healthy and wolfgang though small appears to have been of wiry physique so in january seventeen sixty two he took them on a three weeks excursion to munich where they appeared before the elector maximilian of bavaria with success the following september however the family began their travels in earnest with a small clavier strapped to their vehicle the little band of wanderers set out along the danube by way of linz and several smaller localities to vienna by october six they had reached the capital and they drank in its wonders with the astonished eyes of small-town folk a week later they stood in the presence of the music-loving empress maria theresa and her family and court at the palace of schoenbrunn the children played and were admired and duly rewarded there have come down to us a quantity of pretty anecdotes about the pair how wolfgang climbed up in the lap of the empress and was kissed by her how he insisted on having the composer georg christian wagenseil in the room when he was to play because he understands such things how when he slipped on the polished floor and was helped to his feet by the princess marie antoinette he thanked her and then added i shall marry you for this when i grow up unquestionably the motherly tenderness of maria theresa went out to the child from salzburg yet it is a question whether she actually saw in wolfgang and his sister more than a pair of precocious little people in spite of leopold's extravagant claims certainly she was less agreeable several years later when she wrote her son the archduke ferdinand governor-general of lombardy who contemplated taking wolfgang into his service i do not know why you need saddle yourself with a composer or useless people it discredits your service when such individuals run about the world like beggars at all events leopold was voluble in the letters he wrote to his salzburg landlord hagenauer about the wonders of the vienna visit and the impression exercised everywhere by wolfgang's talents and his lively intelligence and unaffected manner leopold built towering air castles two weeks later wolfgang came down with what was said to be scarlet fever but which was actually according to bernhard baumgartner diagnosed by a german doctor felix huck as erythema nodosum which could have had serious consequences and may have planted the seeds of mozart's last illness before returning to salzburg leopold accepted the invitation of a hungarian magnate to make a flying trip to neighboring pressburg after wolfgang had recovered finally on january five seventeen sixty three the mozarts came home to salzburg 
it is uncertain how much musical stimulation wolfgang obtained from this first viennese visit the one important event in vienna at this period the premiere of gluck's orfeo went unmentioned by either wolfgang or his father however the success of the trip whetted leopold's appetite for more of the same thing after a brief period for recuperation plans were laid for a much more elaborate odyssey to include nothing less than paris and london on june nine seventeen sixty three consequently the family carriage set out for the bavarian frontier the same road by which leopold mozart then a hopeful student had wandered into salzburg this trip was to keep the mozarts away from home for three years success in paris and london the celebrity tour began strictly speaking in munich where the pair of prodigies performed with sensational success before the bavarian elector maximilian the third who wished to hear the young people soon and often but leopold was out for bigger game and wanted incidentally to exhibit his wonder children to his relatives in augsburg before proceeding to world conquests besides old acquaintances the herr kapellmeister had the good luck to present his gifts of god to the noted italian violinist pietro nardini then concertmaster of the court orchestra of stuttgart and to the italian composer worthy niccolo jomelli who was struck by wolfgang's abilities but against whom the mistrustful leopold harboured various unjust suspicions in schwetzingen the mozarts had the first opportunity to hear the then unrivalled mannheim orchestra which was to play a significant part in wolfgang's development he and his sister were put through all their paces as the weeks went by besides playing and improvising they were made to perform all manner of showy stunts wolfgang had to name tones and chords sounded on keyboards covered with a cloth as well as guess the exact pitch of bells glasses and clocks the travellers went on to bonn cologne and aachen where lived the princess amalia sister of frederick the great whose pressing invitations to berlin left leopold cold as soon as he realized she had no money he reflected that the kisses without number which she gave the children would have pleased him better if they had had cash value finally after further progress through the low countries the little band reached paris where the father discovered that most of his letters of recommendation and introduction amounted to little only when they were taken in charge by the bavarian-born baron melchior grimm a literary figure of some distinction did results begin to shape themselves a first-rate publicity man grimm launched a campaign for the youngsters in his correspondence littéraire with the result that doors promptly opened and invitations began to pour in on new year's eve seventeen sixty four the mozarts were asked to a grand couvert at the court in versailles wolfgang stood next to the queen who fed him dainties and translated for the king louis the fifteenth what the boy said to her in german the great madame pompadour was on hand and the elder mozart noted that she must once have been a great beauty for all her present stoutness later when wolfgang offered to give her a kiss she drew back whereupon the boy indignantly asked who does she think she is anyhow our empress herself did not refuse to kiss me leopold was careful to note the countless features of the parisian scene for one thing the abundance of make-up on the faces of the french women was something to revolt an honest german he saw eye to eye with baron grimm in his preference for italian over french music declaring that the latter was not worth a farthing wolfgang was eventually to share his distaste for french customs french art even the french language leopold brought his son to the attention of several prominent german musicians who happened to be in paris such as johann schobert gottfried eckhardt and leancy hanauer all of whom registered appropriate astonishment and presented the children with some of their own compositions suitably inscribed four sonatas for clavier with ad libitum violin parts by wolfgang were printed and on the title-page it was duly noted that their author was only seven years old 
for all their charm and freshness these works clearly betray the improving touch of leopold on april twenty three seventeen sixty four after an easy channel crossing the mozarts arrived in london where the children were announced as miss mozart of eleven and master mozart of seven years of age prodigies of nature the hon danes barrington subjected the boy to scientific tests which demonstrated that his talents were indeed out of the ordinary the musical george the third and queen charlotte received them at st james's palace on april twenty seven a few weeks later there was another concert before the royal couple when the king asked wolfgang to play at sight pieces by wagenseil johann christian bach handel and karl friedrich abel the monarch praised the lad's performance on the organ even more than on the clavier and had him accompany the queen in a song and improvise a melody on a figured bass of handel's leopold wrote home that what his son knew now completely overshadowed his earlier abilities at a charity concert in ronley gardens they made over a hundred guineas yet these successes did not last several concerts had to be postponed because of leopold's sudden indisposition a mental illness of george the third increased alarmingly the political situation was unfavourable and the public began to lose interest in the wonder children but apart from the sympathy wolfgang was always to feel with the english people one experience of his london sojourn really outweighed all others this was the friendship he and johann christian bach the son of johann sebastian formed for each other and the influence the older musician exercised on the creative genius beginning to blossom in the child as hermann abert has written christian bach signified for mozart a blithe elegant counterpart to schobert by virtue of the modernized italianism that came to pervade his style the gallant manner the fresh playful rhythms of his finales and the relaxation modifying the dry composition technique of leopold's are elements for which mozart is deeply indebted to the london bach wolfgang's earlier symphonies and piano music make it plain how much he looked upon johann christian as his model and how fully this master was the chief inspiration of that singing allegro that became a hallmark of the mature mozart not only for his boyhood symphonies and sonatas but for his piano concertos was wolfgang obliged to his great london friend his earliest clavier concertos are largely copies or rearrangements of the concertos and sonatas of johann christian as of schobert hanauer and similar masters from these seeds came those glorious fruits of concerto literature that stand among his grandest and most original achievements leopold had overstayed his leave from his salzburg post but he seemed in no hurry about returning to it he had originally planned to go home by way of italy since an italian trip was regarded as an indispensable finishing touch to an artistic education at the beginning of august seventeen sixty five the mozarts landed once more on the continent both father and son fell ill and then narnerl came down with pneumonia and was actually given the last rites wolfgang scarcely convalescent from a siege of fever composed a medley for piano and orchestra a quod libit of popular tunes the gallimatias musicum a thing of rough humours revealing in its contrapuntal workmanship the tastes and teachings of his father variations on a dutch patriotic song six sonatas for violin and piano a mellifluous symphony in b flat and various other trifles indicate that sickness was not regarded as a valid excuse for idling paris to which they returned in may seventeen sixty six seemed less stirred by the prodigies than it had been on the earlier visit though prince karl wilhelm of brunswick on hearing wolfgang exclaimed in amazement many a kapellmeister dies without ever having learned anything like what this child knows in july they left the french capital and arrived in salzburg the last day of november seventeen sixty six laden with gifts and rich in glowing memories a considerable quantity of new music from wolfgang's pen filled their luggage 
the artist was supplanting the prodigy wolfgang had seen something of the world and had made many valuable contacts the archbishop sigismund von schrattenbach skeptical of the brilliant reports he had heard asked him to compose a cantata die schuldigkeit des ersten gebotes and isolated him for a week to see how much truth there was in all the talk end of part one Part two of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart by Herbert F. Peiser. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part two. Vienna and La Finta Semplice. Not quite a year later, the Mozarts were off again, this time to Vienna, for the betrothal festivities of the Archduchess Maria Josepha and King Ferdinand of Naples. But the great expectations were hardly realized. A smallpox epidemic in the capital carried off the royal bride, and Leopold fled with his family to Olmutz, where both the children contracted the disease. Wolfgang lay blind for nine days, and for some time had to be careful of his eyes. Only on Christmas Eve were they well enough to set out again. On their return to Vienna, Maria Theresa received them kindly, but things had changed economy was the order of the day the aristocracy followed the example set by the imperial household musical activities were reduced and the mozarts felt the pinch interest in the prodigies diminished joseph the second who had succeeded his mother on the throne expressed a desire to hear in vienna an opera of the twelve-year-old boy's composition and suggested such a work to the lessee of the court theatre giuseppe afflioso the result was La Finta Samplice, its libretto based on a Goldoni farce, and it was arranged that the composer should lead it from the harpsichord. Nothing came of the scheme, however, presumably because of intrigues. The youth was partly consoled for this check by a noted physician, the celebrated Dr. Anton Mesmer, an early practitioner of mesmerism, at whose suburban home the one-act German Zingspiel bastine und bastien based on a parody of jean jacques rousseau's famous pastoral la davin du village was performed the little piece for all its simplicity lives on perhaps the most striking thing about the score is the fact that the prelude or entrada begins with the theme that was to be the main subject of beethoven's eroica the travellers came back to salzburg early in seventeen sixty nine the trip had not been a financial profit, but Wolfgang was undoubtedly richer in experience and had added to his creative store. The archbishop delighted them by ordering a performance of La Finta Samplice, though he had no genuine opera buffa personnel at his disposal. The leading soprano part of Rosina was sung by Maria Anna Haydn, Michael Haydn's wife the year was largely devoted to further study and composition chiefly of masses and other church music written at the command of the friendly archbishop and in addition of symphonies and other forms of entertainment music for garden parties festivities and social functions of the high-placed and well-to-do and wolfgang was appointed concertmaster in the archiepiscopal orchestra italy and mozart's early operas leopold realized that the hour had now struck for that long projected trip to italy which he wished to take before wolfganger reached the age and stature which would deprive his accomplishments of all that was marvellous plainly it would not do to let the boy outgrow his precocity and so on december thirteenth seventeen sixty nine father and son set out on an adventure that was to resolve itself into three separate journeys to what was rightly or wrongly esteemed as the home of music and of art in general the youth was now ripe for italy the language he absorbed by second nature as it were everywhere he made valuable new friendships and came across old acquaintances in milan he was commissioned to write an opera seria and the following october he composed mitridate re di ponto which produced on december twenty sixth seventeen seventy amid cries of viva il mastrino had twenty performances 
in bologna he greatly impressed the aged castrato farinelli and the great padre martini dean of italian musicians at naples he had to remove a ring from his finger upon playing to convince the superstitious that it was not the real explanation of his magic skill in rome after a single hearing of the papal choir singing allegri's celebrated miserere which nobody was allowed to copy under penalty of excommunication he wrote it down from memory and then listened to it a second time to make a few minor corrections the pope bestowed on wolfgang the order of the golden spur which enabled him to sign his letters with the whimsical chevalier de mozart he was invited to undergo a difficult examination for membership in the philharmonic academy of bologna and passed it by working out in an hour a problem that consisted of producing in the strict church style an antiphon carite primum the real truth however is that the authorities accepted him only after they had charitably corrected what he submitted it was not long before the philharmonic society of verona likewise conferred membership upon him this time presumably without the preliminary of a test now maestro di capella he was ordered to provide a serenata Ascanio in alba wolfgang completed its fairly voluminous score in twelve days for the impending marriage of archduke rudolf and the princess maria of modena leopold imagined his son made for life but the boy's music for all its charm and fluency still wanted the unmistakably creative touch the tireless traveller dr burney wrote a little later if i may judge of the music which i have heard of his composition in the orchestra he is one further instance of the early fruit being more extraordinary than excellent and the composer Haas believed that young mozart is certainly a prodigy for his age the father adores his son overmuch and does all he can to spoil him but i have so good an opinion of the innate goodness of the boy that i hope that despite his father's adulation he will not allow himself to be spoiled the pair went briefly to salzburg in seventeen seventy one and started south again for milan where escano in alba was to be given in october the work was duly presented for the princely nuptials along with Haas's opera ruggiero likewise commissioned for the festivities according to the father's report the youth's festa teatrale completely eclipsed the work of the venerable master who far from being jealous is said to have remarked this boy will throw us all into the shade scarcely were the travellers home once more than the kindly archbishop died his successor was the former bishop of gurk hieronymus count of colorado like many others the mozarts scented trouble for colorado was a hard-boiled bigot and in every respect the reverse of his predecessor he lives on in history principally as mozart's evil genius and as the man who in the end was to fan wolfgang's detestation of salzburg to white heat and to drive him to open mutiny hieronymus knew by a kind of intuition that his new subjects were not well disposed to him so in the words of a contemporary chronicler he despised them and held himself aloof his rule says palmgartner was something other than the ancien regime of his forerunner the musical highlights of which had been leopold mozart ernst eberlin and cajetan adegasser colorado was a revolutionary and a deadly foe of routine and sought to put his ideas into force by sharpest disciplinary measures his taste however ran to the easy grace of italian music yet he did in his chilly way at first look upon wolfgang as a talent he might use for the greater glory of his court for his new master's festive installation in seventeen seventy two the composer wrote a one-act serenata along the lines of his escano entitled il sogno di scipione to a text by metastasio adapted from cicero the score was a typical occasional work of allegorical character far more important in the creative sense are at least eight symphonies and four divertimenti in all of which are traces of the ripening genius shortly to emerge the third italian visit differed in some ways from the earlier ones 
lucio silia produced in milan in december twenty sixth seventeen seventy two was not acclaimed as mitridate had been outwardly it was successful and enjoyed more than twenty performances but did not hold the stage to begin with the opera had an inferior libretto and wolfgang absorbing other musical influences was less concerned about catering meticulously to italian tastes moreover he was no longer the child prodigy whose every action was to be considered phenomenal but the real reason lay deeper a prophetic ear might have detected the vibrations of a storm and stress period beginning to ferment in the spirit of the artist leopold made a vain effort to secure his son a post at the grand ducal court of tuscany but wolfgang received no more operatic commissions for italy so early in march seventeen seventy three taking a last leave of that land they returned to salzburg where leopold was angered to see colloredo appoint an italian rather than a german to the position of conductor the elder mozart now determined to try his luck in vienna after the death in seventeen seventy four of florian gassmann the court composer leopold hoped to secure the appointment for wolfgang and the two obtained an audience with maria theresa who for all her graciousness merely replaced gassmann by one giuseppe bono at the moment there was no opportunity to earn anything in the capital but the young man became acquainted with something that in the long run was to prove even more rewarding this was the music of joseph haydn whom he was not to meet personally until later the influence of haydn on mozart as of mozart on haydn was to be incalculable from every standpoint on december ninth seventeen seventy four father and son were on a journey once more this time to munich where the bavarian elector maximilian the third had commissioned wolfgang to write an opera for the following carnival it was a buffa la finta giardiniera and on january fourteenth seventeen seventy five the composer wrote to his mother my opera went so well yesterday that i find it impossible to describe the applause in the first place the theatre was so packed that many had to be turned away after every aria there was a wild tumult with hand clappings and shouts of viva maestro which began again as soon as it ended and christian daniel schubart wrote in the teutsche chronik i heard an opera buffa by the marvellous mozart the fires of genius lurk and dart in it yet this is still not the sacred fire which rises to the gods in clouds of incense if mozart does not become a hothouse plant he will be the greatest composer who ever lived il re pastor however archbishop colloredo was growing irritable over these continual absences of his servants he had not been able to refuse the request of the elector to permit the mozarts to go to munich but he at last wanted his vice capellmeister and his son back henceforth it was not going to be so easy to obtain the great cleric's leave to go wandering whatever the reason so for the immediate future the impatient young genius settled down to compose and to perform a stream of works were put on paper in seventeen seventy five and seventeen seventy six five violin concertos were written the first year they are the best known of mozart's concertos for that instrument and were conceived in the main for the violinist brunetti of the court orchestra with all their charm they still stand below the great clavier concertos in grandeur and epoch-making qualities wolfgang did not particularly enjoy the violin although his father exhorted him to practice and told him that he could be the greatest violinist in europe another work in seventeen seventy five was il re pastor a cross between opera and cantata to a poem by metastasio composed for a visit to the archbishop of archduke maximilian a score of sensitive loveliness it is known to-day chiefly for its tender soprano aria with violin solo lamero saro costanta of the many other creations of this period we can only mention in passing the six clavier sonatas for the baron Dienitz, the innumerable variations the serenades, noturni, divertimenti, masses, offertorios, 
organ sonatas litanies graduals the stunning clavier concertos for his own use for the french pianist mademoiselle genome the countess luzzo and other high-placed local amateurs last but far from least he composed the serenade later transformed into a symphony by the elimination of a movement or two for the wealthy hoffner family of whom sigmund hoffner a merchant prince was burgomaster of salzburg mannheim and paris despite all this work the young man chafed at the narrow provincialism of his native town at the absence of true artistic interest at the company he was obliged to keep at the archbishop's table and most of all at that cleric's attitude leopold seeing the dangerous way in which the situation was shaping itself between the young man and his master made an effort to stave off a catastrophe by planning another trip wolfgang applied to the archbishop for his discharge whereupon coloredo who was not really anxious to lose the composer's services told the pair to seek their fortunes where they pleased but at the same time would not permit leopold to leave the father thereupon decided that his son should go to paris perhaps to find some lucrative position at the french court unless he should be lucky enough to discover one somewhere else but since he was forbidden to go along he deputed his wife to go in his place and keep a careful eye on the impulsive young man the webers and paris early on september twenty three seventeen seventy seven wolfgang and his mother who would much rather have remained in salzburg drove off in a newly purchased carriage the departure was a bitter event for leopold whose trouble was such that he forgot to give his son his blessing before the vehicle was out of sight nannerl equally distraught was sick and had to take to her bed to add to the melancholy of the occasion father mozart darkened the house and fell asleep till roused hours later by bimperl the dog the woeful day finally dragged itself to an end it would have been far more terrible had they known that poor maria anna was never to return they went first to munich where wolfgang made an ineffectual appeal to the elector and received that answer with which he was in the course of his life to become so tragically familiar yes my dear child but there is no position free now if only there were etc etc at augsburg the next stop he divided his time between andreas stein the piano-maker whose instruments stirred his interest and his cousin the basil with whom he freely indulged in those ribaldries that so shocked the puritanical generations of the next century from that ancestral seat they turned to mannheim which was a very different story for here mozart found all manner of musical interests and important personalities and here he fell devastatingly in love he had made the acquaintance of the family of friedelin and maria cecile weber a streak of bohemianism ran through the lot of them the father in straitened circumstances eked out an existence in mannheim as singer musician copyist prompter in short a kind of man-of-all-work in the theatre and orchestra the mother was a sinister creature an out-and-out -out adventurous the couple had four daughters josepha aloysia constanz and sophie constanz was in the fullness of time to become mozart's wife but his feelings were at first kindled by aloysia who was then only fifteen and with whom maria cecile at this stage set about to tempt the young man who was quickly bowled over by the girl's feminine charms her lovely voice and her musicianship in the years to come each of these women was to play some part in the composer's life a few years later there was born in a closely related branch of the weber family that figure who made the name immortal karl maria von weber so that through marriage the creators of their freischutz and of die sauberflöte became cousins love caused wolfgang to build castles in the air and to concoct extravagant schemes he composed abundantly in mannheim planned operas and what not for his idolized aloysia and before long was writing to his father proposing to give up the paris venture altogether and set out on a trip to italy with the webers leopold was horrified 
the more so as his wife wrote telling him exactly how things stood father mozart sternly laid down the law to his son and ended with the words off with you to paris and that soon find your place among great people ot kaiser ot nihil the mere thought of seeing paris ought to have preserved you from all these flighty ideas wolfgang did not it is true rebel and in the end he went to paris but he answered his father with some heat he declared that he was no longer a child and had no intention of tolerating aspersions on his conduct with aloysia there are some people he added who think it impossible to love a girl without evil designs and this pretty word mistress is indeed a fine one but leopold had for the moment won his point and in march seventeen seventy eight wolfgang and his mother were off the paris adventure turned out a dismal fiasco even melchior grimm once so helpful was not interested this time he was willing to promote a sensation who gave promise of being a money-maker but as alfred einstein has noted it was wolfgang's character that made leopold wrong in his estimate of paris and the parisian nobility for wolfgang was no conqueror and he could not have conquered paris even if he had wanted to how carefully Grieg's conquest of paris had been prepared not only ambassadors and queens but the entire public took part in these preparations mozart slipped into paris quietly and unobserved accompanied by his mother who had come along to keep an eye on him he detested paris thought continually of alioso had no use for the now surly grim turned down the offer of an organist post in versailles feeling that the place was no more than a suburb had some unsatisfactory dealings with le gros director of the concert spirituel composed for the parisian stage no more than the ballet les petits reins easily succumbed to some of le gros intrigues and was demoralized generally only one work of his the d major symphony k two ninety seven was outspokenly successful to climax his woes his mother fell ill and died on july three seventeen seventy eight he had to ask the old salzburg family friend abbe boulanger to break the news to his father and sister and he wrote you have no idea what a dreadful time i have been having here until one is well known nothing can be done in the matter of composition from my description of the music here you may have gathered that i am not very happy and that i am trying to get away as quickly as possible as quickly as possible was not till september seventeen seventy eight he decided reluctantly to return to salzburg to the archbishop's service where he would conduct and accompany but not play violin even so he was momentarily tempted to stay on in paris and might even have done so if grimm had not been obviously eager to be rid of him he did not hurry back to the hated salzburg but stopped off in strasburg mannheim and munich where he found the flighty alioso already the wife of joseph lange the itinerant actor to whom posterity owes the familiar unfinished portrait of mozart when he finally did submit to the inevitable trip home he lacked the courage to meet his bereaved father alone and so took his dear little basil with him idomeneo at the archbishop's table he sat between the castrato cicerelli and the violinist brunetti if he felt revolted by his present circumstances he seems however to have taken refuge in the inner sanctuary of his spirit he created quantities of priceless works and in so doing could forget situations in themselves repugnant there were church compositions serenades divertimenti the gorgeous symphonie concertante for violin and viola k three sixty four a triple concerto for violin viola and cello the adorable e flat concerto for two pianos k three sixty five three symphonies in g b flat and c some music for gabler's drama tamos kernig in egyptian which he had begun five years earlier and was a foretaste of the magic flute and lastly an operatic fragment entitled zaida after mozart's death and destined to remain a torso 
by seventeen eighty however wolfgang was to some degree compensated for his disillusionments while labouring on zaida he was commissioned by the bavarian elector karl theodor to write an opera seria for the munich carnival of seventeen eighty one the munich authorities picked a libretto idomeneo re di creta ossia ilia ed idemante which was based on a book by antoine danchet and which as composed by andre compra as far back as seventeen twelve had enjoyed a day of fame in paris it dealt with the tale of the cretan king who had made a rash jephthah vow to neptune on returning from the trojan war and was saved from sacrificing his son by a deus ex machina the libretto was put in shape by the salzburg cleric gambatista veresco and called for in accordance with french models massive crowd scenes ballets choruses and all the effects of a large-scale spectacle as well as vocal virtuosity and elaborate instrumental tone painting for a change mozart had things more or less his own way the weber family had moved to vienna much to leopold's relief and for the moment the composer had no time to worry about alioso but went ahead putting his new opera into shape and helping to prepare the production on the whole he met with sympathetic cooperation the elector called theodor welcomed him cordially the intendant count sico was helpful and the women singers declared themselves pleased with their arias the chief difficulties were caused by the aging tenor Roff, who had the title role and the sixteen-year-old artificial soprano cast for the part of Idamantes. Mozart, who used to call him Mio Molto Amoto Castrato del Prato, deplored the poor boy's lack of stage experience, musicianship, and vocal method nevertheless idomeneo when brought out late in january seventeen eighty one was warmly acclaimed and the elector who had followed the rehearsal from the first marvelled that so small a head should contain such great things insisting he had never been so stirred by any music he had reason for his enthusiasm the score of Idomeneo is one of its composer's most superb achievements, and if it lives on to-day, chiefly as a museum piece, it does so because, like Mitridate, Lucio Silla, and Il Re Pastor before it, and La Clemenza di Tito after it, the work is a specimen of opera seria, a form that had lost every trace of vitality and dramatic punch yet to the end of his days its creator valued it highly and made some unavailing efforts to reanimate it end of part two part three of wolfgang amadeus mozart by herbert f peiser this librivox recording is in the public domain part three Mozart's Break with Salzburg Mozart had reason to suppose that the work might gain him a permanent and rewarding position. Once more he was disappointed, and a short time after the production he received a summons from Salzburg to join the archbishop in Vienna, whither Colloredo had gone with a part of his musical staff. Leopold, it should be added, was left at home wolfgang boiled inwardly at the prospect of having the honour once more of sitting above the cooks at table his father begged him to be patient but to no avail in a way he welcomed the present call to vienna and seemed to sense his impending liberation if without knowing exactly how it was to come it seems as if good fortune is about to welcome me here he wrote his parent not long afterwards from the capital and now i feel that i must stay indeed i felt when i left munich that without knowing why i looked forward most eagerly to vienna he was seeking an opportunity to break forever with his detested chief to whom he alluded as an etzlümel arch booby he soon found his chance the archbishop at first refused mozart permission to appear at the tonkunstler societet about which he wrathfully wrote to his father yet a postscript added that in the end he got it 
that his place at table was between the valets and the cooks is alfred einstein says rightly shocking both to the composer and to us but Mozart's rank as court organist was actually that of personal servant, and according to eighteenth-century etiquette, which knew nothing of special treatment for genius, this seating at table was formerly correct. In the end, the threatened explosion did occur. Coloredo ordered him back to Salzburg on a certain day. Alleging some important engagement in Vienna, he refused, and when the archbishop told him he could go to the devil— he applied for his dismissal from the cleric's service. Three times he presented applications. Finally, when he made an effort to enter Coloredo's apartment to hand him the paper personally, Count Arco, son of the court chamberlain, kicked him out of the room. But Mozart did get the discharge he had demanded. The tale of the kick is familiar even to people who have not the vaguest familiarity with eighteenth-century codes. We might be well advised, however, to suspend our judgment till we know both sides of the celebrated story. "'No more Salzburg for me,' Wolfgang gaily wrote his father. Barring repeated journeys to different cities, Vienna was to be his home for the rest of his days. He was not to find the material rewards and the secure position he had sought for so long, but he had that freedom his spirit craved.' and in Vienna he was to absorb those creative impulses that Haydn had known before him, and Beethoven was to know after him. In a mood of elation, he begged his father to leave Salzburg and join him in Vienna. But Leopold was no longer young, and besides, he was made of other clay. Marriage Mozart renewed his ties with the Webers once more. Alioso, indeed, was now out of his reach, but there were three other daughters, the youngest still a child, to be sure. The oldest, Josepha, had a good voice, but she left Wolfgang cold. He was more attracted to Alioso's sister, Constanza, a fact that was not lost on the scheming mother Weber, now a widow, content to rent rooms and take in boarders. In May 1781, he settled in the Weber house, Zum Auge Gottes, just off the Graben. Needless to say, Leopold was greatly upset, for he had as low an opinion of the Webers as ever. But Wolfgang was no longer disposed to let his father's tastes sway him, and when he felt that he really loved Costanza, he determined to make her his wife, regardless of parental wishes. The unscrupulous Madame Weber, pleased at the turn of affairs, took care that gossip should spread, and people began to talk about the probability of the marriage. Mozart, yielding to Mother Weber's advice, left the Augagottes in September 1781, though returning for daily visits. Constanza's mother played her cards cleverly so as to compromise her daughter, and enjoyed the satisfaction of having Mozart ask his father for his approval. A Weber for a daughter-in-law was the last thing Leopold wanted. Finally, on August 4, 1782, the couple married, the elder Mozart's reluctant consent not arriving in Vienna until August 5. He never forgave his son, however, for this step. No more did Nanerl, who had quite as little use for her brother's wife. Later, after the composer's death, Schlichtigrel's necrology said of Constanza, Mozart found in her a good mother for the two children she bore him, who sought to restrain him from many follies and dissipations. The rest of which passage Constanza was subsequently moved to make illegible. Be all of which as it may, there is no use in pretending that Mozart was, earlier or later, in the least indifferent to feminine allurements. Sometimes it was the women who plagued him with attentions, a capital instance of which was his pupil, the pianist Josephine Arnhammer, a talented but exceedingly repulsive person, of whom he left us a gruesome picture in a letter dated August 22, 1781 she is as fat as a farm wench perspires so that you feel inclined to vomit and goes about so scantily clad that you really can read as plain as print pray do look here it was for this same arnhammer none the less that he wrote the adorable clavier concerto k four fifty three 
Alfred Einstein maintains that Constanza owes her fame to the fact that Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart loved her, and in so doing preserved her name for eternity, as a fly is preserved in amber. But this does not mean that she deserved either his love or the fame it brought her. Certainly she could not follow his flights of genius. Neither was she always above reproach in her private conduct. Before their marriage her honest and devoted lover was writing to point out her thoughtless behaviour in allowing some man to measure her leg in a game of forfeits, and nearly a decade later he was begging her to consider appearances, to be careful of her honour, and to keep away from the Baden Casino because the company is, uh, you understand what I mean. Einstein believed that the only woman of whom Constanza had a right to be jealous was Nancy Storace, his first Susanna. Between Mozart and her there must have been a deep and sympathetic understanding. She was beautiful, an artist, and a finished singer. Die Entführung aus dem Zerei the composer was probably delighted to have the chance to place on the stage a character named Constanza, and in the summer and autumn of 1781 he began the music of his next major opera, Belmont und Constanza, or Die Entführung aus dem Zerei, the abduction from the seraglio. This Singspiel, the book of which was originally the work of Christian Friedrich Bretzner, had been presented a year earlier in Germany with a score by Johann André. Under Wolfgang's careful supervision, the three-act piece underwent dramatic and textual modifications by Christian Gottlob Stefani the Younger. Mozart had written his father, The book is good, the subject is Turkish, and is called The Abduction from the Seraglio. Rehearsals did not start till June 1782, and on July 16 of that year the work was produced in Vienna with extraordinary success. The stimulus back of Stefani's revisions was unquestionably the penetrating theatre sense of the composer himself. Into the love songs of the tenor, Belmonte, Mozart poured all his tender feelings for Constanza Weber, whom he was shortly to lead to the altar. The characterizations throughout have a life, a diversity, and a psychological truth that had not been met with in any previous Mozartian operatic effort. The emperor, though he recognized the genius in the work, thought it necessary to warn Mozart that the music seemed to him too good for the Viennese, and contained a powerful quantity of notes, whereupon the ready-witted Mozart retorted, "'Just as many as are necessary, Your Majesty!' His older contemporary, Gluck, was himself stirred to enthusiasm by the work, in which he unquestionably detected the influence of his own exotic Les Pellerines de la Mecque, and invited the composer to dinner. Die Entführung, which Karl Maria von Weber was to say was such a work as Mozart could have written only once in his lifetime, quickly spread through most other theatres of Central Europe, where, after close to two hundred years, it still leads a lusty existence. The more amusing, therefore, is a notice the disgruntled Bretzner inserted in a Leipzig newspaper, A certain person in Vienna named Mozart has had the effrontery to misuse my drama, Belmonte und Constanza, for an opera libretto. I herewith protest most solemnly that I reserve the right to take further steps against this outrage." On the surface the newly married couple were happy, yet it might be inquiring too closely to ask whether Wolfgang did not, as time passed, suffer from that deep-seated loneliness and lack of understanding that are sooner or later the lot of a genius of this calibre. Under today's conditions we have reason to assume that a triumph like Die Entführung and the numerous other treasures he was giving the world would lift him above material cares. Instead, financial troubles began to thicken about him, and grew continually more burdensome. They were indeed to beset him to his end. For all the air it created, the opera did not bring its composer the appointment he expected, and money was becoming a pressing necessity. Constanza's pregnancies were frequent during her married life, and though only two children survived infancy, to become, it is ironic to reflect, wretched but fairly long-lived mediocrities, 
her various confinements and her slow recovery from them did not help to further her housewifely qualities it is not wholly surprising that mozart's religious convictions which had earlier been a sort of childlike faith weakened little by little the more so because he was brought into growing contact with men who were profound thinkers and of whom many belonged to the secret society of freemasons freemasonry had political implications and was frowned upon by the church frederick the great had been a freemason goethe was one likewise joseph the second gluck and joseph haydn eventually mozart persuaded his father to join the society who shall say that its principles and philosophies did not serve wolfgang as a protective armor enabling him the more bravely to endure his social and material tribulations pupils and friends haydn mozart took his wife to salzburg in the summer of seventeen eighty three he had made a vow the previous year that when he married constanza and presented her to his father he would bring along a newly composed mass for presentation in his native town the superb one in c minor was the outcome but for some reason it remained unfinished we cannot speculate here on the reason for its incompleteness the torso or shall we say patchwork was rehearsed in st peter's church in salzburg and constanza sang some of the soprano solos despite its incompleteness the c minor mass is a soaring masterwork the music of which mozart later put to use in the oratorio da vida penitente the relentless dislike of the webers that both leopold and nannerl continued to harbour was not mollified by this visit which proved uncomfortable as long as it lasted wolfgang and his wife were relieved when the troublesome duty call came to its chilly end and they were back in vienna once more there was no end of professional business for mozart to transact composition in flooding abundance lessons to give concerts academies to organize musical personages to cultivate just now at least there were no interminable travels such as had filled mozart's boyhood years his pupils were sometimes talented sometimes the reverse a few striking names stand out among them johann nepomuk hummel xavier zusmeyer thomas atwood of the composers and executants with whom he came in contact we must mention clemente salieri paisiello regini haydn with clemente he appeared as a pianist in a contest before joseph the second and some visiting russian blue bloods so evenly were the two players matched that the competition was declared a draw Paisiello, composer of the Barber of Seville, was a lovable character for whom Wolfgang developed a great liking. Salieri, a disciple of Gluck and a teacher of Schubert, appears to have criticized some of Mozart's works, and Viennese gossip did what it could to make the matter worse. The result was that Salieri lives on in history largely because of a wild slander that he had given Mozart a poison, causing the latter's untimely death the meeting with joseph haydn resulted in one of the noblest and most rewarding friendships the records of music afford artistically their creations benefited inestimably from the mutual influence of their works and personalities haydn says dr karl geiringer was fascinated by mozart's quicksilver personality while mozart enjoyed the sense of security that haydn's steadfastness and warmth of feeling gave him it was as if the two men kindled brighter sparks in each other's souls they played chamber music together whenever haydn made a trip to vienna and the younger man was quick to acknowledge that it was from his older colleague he first really learned to write string quartets the six that he composed between seventeen eighty two and seventeen eighty five and dedicated with moving words to his beloved friend haydn are doubtless among the finest he wrote it was on a visit of leopold mozart's to vienna that haydn made to him the oft-quoted remark i tell you before god and as an honest man that your son is the greatest composer known to me either in person or by reputation 
and later when someone questioned a detail in don giovanni and asked haydn's opinion he replied i cannot settle this dispute but this i know mozart is the greatest composer that the world now possesses it enrages me to think that the unparalleled mozart has not yet been engaged by some imperial or royal court do forgive this outburst but i love the man too much it is heartbreaking that haydn was not able as he would have loved to be to secure a post for mozart in england mozart had another encounter of a different sort at this period in vienna acquaintance with the music of johann sebastian bach through the baron von schwieten he had opportunity to know the scores of bach and handel and later even to write for certain Handel oratorios additional accompaniments for use in performances von Schwieten was in the habit of giving on Sundays at the Imperial Library and in some private homes, and the depth, the grandeur, and the polyphony of these masters he assimilated to the added greatness of his own mature works. Hofner Symphony with his concerts teaching clavier playing and miscellaneous composing mozart may well have felt as he remarked on one occasion that people sometimes expected impossibilities of me the hofner family in salzburg for instance asked leopold to write a symphony for some family festivity to be ready in something like a fortnight wolfgang at that time up to his ears in a quantity of other schemes found the labor shifted to his own shoulders by his father, who was otherwise busied. Somehow or other he contrived to turn out, in a trifle over the appointed time, it is true, the work we now know as the Hofner Symphony. The excellent Salzburg burgomaster Siegmund Hofner appears to have been well pleased. The composer himself instantly forgot the work, and was astonished and delighted, when, a considerable time afterwards, his father sent him the score. He worked at several operatic projects, but nothing lasting came of them, not even of The Goose of Cairo, which contains charming passages, and which now and then people have attempted to revive there was indeed an amateur performance in vienna of idomeneo but these and several other schemes must all be dismissed as transient compared with the masterpiece we now approach le nozze de figaro the marriage of figaro le nozze de figaro mozart had longed for years to write a german opera he boasted of himself as a thoroughly patriotic German, and longed for the day when we should dare to feel as Germans, and even, if I may say so, to sing in German. The nearest he had come to composing a German singspiel was when, as a child, he had produced his little song play, Bestien und Bestien, and again when, in 1782, he turned out the inimitable Die Entführung aus dem Serai but his ambitions soared even higher and he consumed no end of time and energy perusing the countless opera books sent to him without finding anything that suited his true artistic and dramatic purposes for a while he had dreamed of accomplishing something in his mannheim days even listening with interest but nothing more to stuff like holzbauer's gunther von schwarzburg though he briefly thought of a rudolf von habsburg he had no choice in the end but to return to italian models now however with a difference soon after the amateur presentation of idomeneo in vienna he had the good fortune to be brought together with lorenzo da ponte whose real name was emmanuel conegliano and who belonged to a jewish family in cognada near venice the youth entered a theological seminary and became an industrious student with a poetic bent which resulted in quantities of italian and latin verse an outspoken adventurer with countless amorous escapades a la casanova to his credit he began his theatrical career in dresden went to vienna where he was to enjoy the favor of joseph the second and in the process of time went to london and finally to america where he became a teacher of languages a liquor merchant a theatre enthusiast and what not he died in new york many years after mozart but like him was buried in a grave of which all traces have been lost mozart suggested to his picturesque collaborator 
who cheerfully wrote opera books for Salieri, Martin, Rignini, and others, a libretto to be adapted from Pierre Augustin Caron de Beaumarchais, Les Noches de Figaro, of which Paisiello had recently composed Beaumarchais's predecessor, Le Barbier de Seville but figaro had been prohibited in france because it reflected on the morals of the aristocracy and the same ban had been in effect in vienna da ponte altering it for mozart's purposes adroitly eliminated its barbed satire and then tactfully explaining his alterations to the emperor secured his permission for the performance the composer, who limited his teaching to the afternoon in order to complete the score, had been as touchy as gunpowder and threatened to burn the opera if it were not produced by a certain time. To Joseph the Second's credit it must be said that the music delighted him as soon as Mozart played him a few samples. Figaro was produced at the Burgtheater on May 1, 1786. A lucky star shone on its birth in spite of intrigues set in motion against it. Its success was tremendous, and was abundantly foreshadowed during the rehearsals. The Irish tenor Michael Kelly, Italianized as Ocelli, left us in his memoirs a striking account of the delight with which the singers and orchestra joined the listeners at the end of the first act in acclaiming the composer i shall never forget he says his little animated countenance when lighted up with the glowing rays of genius it is as impossible to describe as it would be to paint sunbeams father mozart wrote to nannerl that not only had almost every number to be repeated but that at the following performances five were encored the letter duet having to be sung three times in the end, the emperor forbade repetitions. That season, Figaro received nine hearings, and for the two following years, not a single one. Mozart's opponents, after a momentary check, had conspired successfully once more. Prague Luckily, the incorrigibly musical checks championed Mozart to the limit, with the Entführung he had won them heart and soul, and by the time Figaro reached Prague, that city was on the way to becoming the true Mozart capital of Europe. From that moment nothing seemed greatly to matter but that opera. In the composer's own words, people would listen to nothing else and talk of nothing else. Its melodies were worked up into dance arrangements, players in beer gardens, and even the wandering street musicians, who begged for pennies on corners, had to sing or strum their Non Puy André and the rest of the tunes if they wanted any passer-by to pay attention to them. Truly a great honor for me, mused the composer. Prague, now a high altar of Mozart worship, was for some time to remain so the creator of figaro had valued friends in prague among the dearest of these were the duchecks whom he had known in salzburg franz a gifted pianist and composer and his wife josepha both older than mozart josepha an excellent musician became an exceptional singer and for her wolfgang was to compose some superb though difficult concert arias she was well to do and with the money an admirer lavished on her she bought herself an estate known as the Bert Gromka, still one of the show-places of Prague, despite the vicissitudes of more than a century and a half. Here Mozart was often an honoured guest, and to this day the villa and the hilly garden surrounding it seem to breathe his spirit. The permanent Italian company that supplied opera to the people of Prague, though not large, was exceedingly capable at this time it was managed by a certain pasquale bondini its two efficient conductors both of them bohemians joseph strolbach and j b kuchart were heart and soul devoted to mozart the intensely music-loving czechs jammed mozart's academies and could not hear enough of his symphonies and clavier works small wonder therefore that bondini resolved to take advantage of the heaven-sent opportunity of mozart's presence to commission him to write a new opera for the company's next season the fee was the usual sum of a hundred ducats no more the opera don giovanni 
actually much more could be said of this prague visit of mozart's at one of his concerts he presented for the first time the d major symphony which sent its hearers into such raptures that the world has forever named it the prague symphony when he arrived from vienna it had been arranged that he was to stay with the ducheks but josepha being away mozart accepted the hospitality of the aristocrat count thun and sat as an honoured guest among the great of the land he doubtless remembered how at colorado's court his table companions had been cooks and grooms he was taken to the sumptuous dwelling of still another local patrician the count canal and so it continued from day to day yet he found time to write a piece for a wandering harpist which the latter played everywhere boasting that mozart had specially composed it for him End of part three. Part four of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart by Howard Pazer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part four. Death of Leopold Mozart. In February 1787, Mozart was back in Vienna in a joyous frame of mind one may question that this jubilant mood was of long duration that the new opera was to be ready as early as the following october was hardly the greatest of his worries for mozart like haydn bach and other masters of that century was accustomed to a speed of creative production that puts our machine age to shame the welcome the viennese accorded the returning traveller flushed by the recollection of his recent triumphs was frosty also there came the news that his father's health was failing naturally reflected leopold old people do not grow younger wolfgang wrote his parents in words that nobly convey the essence of his own mature philosophy i need not tell you with what anxiety i await better news from you although i am wont in all things to anticipate the worst since death is the true goal of our lives i have made myself so well acquainted during the past two years with this true and best friend of mankind that the idea of it no longer holds any terror for me but rather much that is tranquil and comforting and i thank god that he has granted me the good fortune to obtain this opportunity of regarding death as the key to our true happiness i never lie down in bed without considering that young as i am perhaps i may on the morrow be no more yet not one of those who know me say that i am morose or melancholy and for this i thank my creator and wish heartily that the same happiness may be given to my fellow-men one is moved to think of schubert's words to his father a few years later when looking upon the lakes and peaks of the austrian alps he wrote as if death were the worst thing that could befall one could one but look on these divine lakes and mountains he would deem it a great happiness to be restored for a new life to the inscrutable forces of the earth all the same mozart was profoundly shaken when on may twenty eighth his father passed away without the opportunity to see his son once more you can realize my feelings he wrote his friend gottfried von jachten we shall not go far wrong when we surmise that these deep and solemn emotions coloured to a considerable degree some of the more tragic pages of the nascent don giovanni the book of which de ponte was now writing for him while working at the same time on librettos for salieri and martin in the spring of seventeen eighty seven the composer had a brief but memorable encounter for at this time there came briefly to vienna from bonn a sixteen-year-old youth ludwig von beethoven a protege of the count waldstein presumably to study with mozart the latter heard his visitor improvise and was at first unimpressed because he believed the extemporization had been memorized but was converted as soon as he gave the young rhinelander a complicated theme to treat on the spot the originality and seriousness of what he heard stirred the older musician to the prophecy this young man is going to make the world talk about him but mozart had at the moment no leisure for this prospective pupil 
who returned shortly to bonn and on his later trip after mozart's death placed himself under the direction of haydn don giovanni in mid-september mozart and constanza went to prague bringing the partly finished don giovanni score bondini had found the composer lodging at the house on the kolmark called the three lion cubs across the way at the inn zum Plateis, rooms were engaged for da ponte and as the windows faced each other composer and librettist had long discussions across the narrow street about details of the book in the preparation of which mozart with his keen dramatic instincts played a dominating role he and constanza appeared however to have spent quite as much time with the dutchkies at the betranka as at the three lion cubs rehearsals consumed a great amount of energy there were numerous modifications to be made in the music the young baritone luigi bassi who had the title role demanded five recastings of the duet la sidarum before he was satisfied with the music and mozart had all manner of trouble with caterina micelli the elvira in addition the singer of zerlina caterina bondini could not utter the peasant girl's shriek in the first finale to the composer's satisfaction until he terrified her by grasping her roughly and thus causing her to scream exactly as he wanted after one of the last rehearsals the conductor kuchars being asked by the master for his candid opinion of the opera replied encouragingly whatever comes from mozart will always delight in bohemia i assure you dear friend i have spared myself no pains to produce something worthy for the people of prague declared the composer who had already boasted that my praguers understand me here is the place no doubt to tell once more the oft-repeated tale of the overture put on paper according to a hoary legend the night before the premiere while constanza kept the master awake by plying him with punch and telling him stories as a matter of fact the overture was written the night before the dress rehearsal and it was nothing unusual for mozart to write down at the last moment a work mentally finished in every detail a few days after the first performance the prague oberpostamt zeitung published a review that probably excels anything ever written about the opera it read simply connoisseurs and musicians say that nothing like it has ever been produced in prague the opinion is probably as true to-day as in seventeen eighty seven for there is literally nothing like don giovanni either among its composer's creations or elsewhere one can only share the emotion of rossini when being shown the manuscript score he said to its owner the singer pauline Verdot garcia i want to bow the knee before this sacred relic and echo the words of richard wagner what is more perfect than every number in don giovanni where else has music won so infinitely rich an individuality been able to characterize so surely so definitely and in such exuberant plenitude as here figaro is if you will the more perfect artistic entity of the two don giovanni is looser less consistent on the surface even grossly illogical but so too is human nature and if all the world's a stage what more than a drama giocoso is the experience of life whatever the narrow intent of lorenzo da ponta when he carpentered the book out of well-worn odds and ends it was with a profound knowledge of the sorrows and absurdities of humankind that mozart breathed into it an abiding soul long live da ponte long live mozart had written the stage director domenico guarasone all impresarios all artists must exalt them to the skies for as long as such men live there can be no more question of theatre miseries the duchecks outdid themselves to make life pleasant for their guests mozart found time to compose several songs and even a superb concert air bella mia fiamma adio for josepha after that lady had locked him up in the garden-house till he had finished the promised music 
on november fifteenth seventeen eighty seven which virtually coincided with the composer's return to vienna gluck died less than a month later joseph the second appointed mozart to the older master's post of kammer compositeur with an annual salary of eight hundred gulden gluck had received two thousand and before long mozart was complaining that his pay was too much for what he did too little for what he could do what he did was principally to supply minuets contradances and teutsche for court balls and similar occasions the year seventeen eighty eight dawned in gloomy fashion for mozart to be sure don giovanni had its first viennese hearing on may seven with a cast including his sister-in-law aloysia lange as doña anna catarina cavalieri the original costanza in the Inführung, as elvira and francesco benucci the first figaro as leporello mozart had cut out some numbers replacing them with new ones eliminating the platitudinous epilogue and ended the work with the prodigious hell music of don giovanni's disappearance the emperor remarked the opera is divine perhaps even finer than figaro but it is a rather tough morsel for the teeth of my viennese to which mozart replied let us give them time to chew it symphonies in e flat g minor and c major yet from now on he was to pay for his prague triumphs with a kind of fateful persistence things seemed to go wrong that an infant daughter died was a rather familiar affliction of the children of the mozart couple only the sons karl and raymond leopold survived infancy money troubles plagued him unremittingly again and again he had to appeal for loans to michael puchberg a merchant and brother mason and later to franz hoftemel a jurist of his acquaintance whose wife was one of his pupils but by and large these pupils were becoming scarcer and there seemed steadily less patronage for the academies he planned to make matters worse costanza's management of the household appeared to go from bad to worse the arrangements of works like Handel's Assis and Galathea and Messiah, which he was making about this time for the parsimonious Baron von Schwieten, brought in as good as nothing. Mozart's affairs were falling into a sordid, not to say tragic, state. Small wonder, therefore, that he grasped at the opportunity to settle outside of Vienna proper in a house in the Währing district, where the air was purer than in the heart of the city, and where he had the added advantages of quiet and a garden. A change of residence had never been a particular hardship for the Mozarts. In the space of nine years they moved eleven times in Vienna alone their life says alfred einstein was like a perpetual tour changing from one hotel room to another in one of the handsomer dwellings schulergasse eight the ceiling of mozart's workroom had fine plaster ornamentation with sprites and cherubs i am convinced that mozart never wasted a glance on it he was ready at any instant to exchange vienna for another city or austria for another country he was thinking of a trip to Russia as a result of conversations with the Russian ambassador in Dresden in 1789, but he had to be satisfied with smaller journeys and with journeys within Vienna. In his varying surroundings, however, he boasted of being able to accomplish more work in a few days than elsewhere in a month. The finest fruit of this suburban sojourn is the glorious symphonic trilogy, the masterpieces in E-flat, G minor, and C major, composed in June, July, and August, respectively, the third, the sublime Jupiter, the last of Mozart's forty-one symphonies, and given its deathless name no one knows exactly by whom or why the three which have a profound psychological connection were written in all probability for a series of academies that never took place however this may be they are the crown of mozart's symphonic compositions and rank indisputably as the greatest symphonies before beethoven cosi fan tutti in april seventeen eighty nine a ray of hope suddenly appeared to illuminate his depressing horizon 
a friend and pupil, the young prince Karl Lichowski, who had estates in Silesia and an important rank in the Prussian army, invited Mozart to accompany him on a trip to Berlin. Lichnowsky enjoyed influence at the court of the music-loving Prussian king, Frederick William II, and seemed ready to recommend his teacher to the good graces of the monarch. At last Mozart had reason to anticipate a well-paying post. The pleasure-loving Constanza resigned herself with the best grace possible to remain behind. The travellers stopped off in Prague, in Dresden, in Leipzig, where Mozart played the organ in St. Thomas Church, in so masterly a fashion that Bach's erstwhile pupil, the aged cantor Johann Friedrich Dolz, believed for a moment that his old master had come back to life, and hastened to show his delighted guest one of the Bach motets the church possessed. On April 25, Mozart arrived at the court in Potsdam, where the king gave him a hundred Friedrichsdor, ordered six string quartets and some easy clavier sonatas for his daughter, but did nothing about a Kapellmeister position or a commission for an opera. Mozart did go to the theatre in Berlin, where he heard his own Entführung, was applauded by the audience, and audibly scolded a blundering violinist in the orchestra. But his fortunes had not materially changed, and in May he was writing to Constanza, my dear little wife, you will have to get more satisfaction from my return than from any money I am bringing. When he reached home and found her suffering from a foot trouble, he sent her, regardless of his depleted purse, to nearby Baden for a cure, at the same time admonishing her to beware of flirtations. Then he set to work on the quartets for the Prussian king, of which he finished three, the last he was to write, and a single easy sonata, instead of the promised six, for the Princess Frederica. In September 1789 he was to compose for his friend, the clarinet virtuoso Anton Stadler, the celestial clarinet quintet, K581, which for sheer euphony is almost without parallel in its composer's writings. The success of a revival of Figaro in August 1789 appears to have moved the emperor to approach Mozart with a commission for a new opera. The outcome was Così fan tutti, the incentive to the plot being an incident said to have taken place in Viennese society. Once again Lorenzo da Ponte was called upon to put the piece into shape. The fundamentals of the story are to be found in Boccaccio, and it may well have been in the Decameron that de Ponte discovered the real basis of his dexterous and amusing, though highly artificial, comedy. We know little about the circumstances surrounding the composition of the piece. On January 21, 1790, Cosifan Tutti was performed at the Burgtheater. The reviews, if middling, were not outright unfavorable the music of mozart is charming the plot amusing enough wrote count zinzendorf in his diary and the journal des luxus und der moden remarked it is sufficient to say of the music that it was composed by mozart until the following autumn the work achieved only ten performances it is not unreasonable to explain this by the fact that in seventeen ninety joseph the second who for some time had been ailing died and was succeeded by a ruler of very different tendencies, his brother Leopold II. Later Works With the accession of the new emperor, Mozart briefly imagined the gates of his good luck were about to open. He was quickly disillusioned. Leopold II was hard, cold, unmusical. He instantly dismissed some of his predecessor's most faithful artistic servitors. De Ponte, for one, was dropped, Mozart's opponent, Salieri, cautiously withdrew into obscurity and waited behind the scenes for a new opportunity. Van Schwieten tried to obtain for Mozart a position as teacher of the Archduke Franz, but nothing came of the well-meant effort, and presently the composer found his pupils reduced to two. His health began to trouble him alarmingly, with headaches and tooth troubles. 
he had the mortification of being ignored when the king of naples visited vienna while sialieri and haydn enjoyed special honours he was not even asked to participate in the musical festivities in connection with the emperor's coronation in october seventeen ninety or to travel to frankfurt where the ceremony was to take place so he decided to make the journey at his own expense hoping against hope for some distinction or reward though he did not obtain either he at least had the satisfaction of knowing that his don giovanni figaro in Führung, and even the early finta girdenera were relished in neighbouring mainz the opera chosen for the actual coronation was ratchnitsky's oberon however the frankfurt town council graciously allowed mozart to give a concert on his own responsibility at a local theatre october thirteen at eleven in the morning plenty of honour but little money he wrote he played two concertos probably the f major k four fifty nine and the d major k five thirty seven and a rondo as ever his improvisation impressed deeply only a royal luncheon party and a manoeuvre of hessian troops were counter-attractions that cut down the attendance on the way home he stopped off in mannheim and munich saw his old friends Kanabich and ram played at an academy the elector karl theodor gave for the returning king of naples and went home to vienna where constanza had moved their effects into a new apartment in the rauenstein gasse destined to be his last home on earth in his new dwelling the composer completed by december two superb works the string quintet in d k five nine three and the stunning adagio and allegro in f minor k five nine four for an organ cylinder in a clock about that same time the director of the italian opera in london one o'reilly suggested that he come for half a year to england to write two operas for that theatre and give concerts and promised him three hundred pounds sterling nothing stood in the way of o'reilly's suggestion except operas that the master was soon to provide for vienna and prague soon afterwards haydn on his way to london took leave of his younger friend who bade him farewell with the heart-shaking words i fear papa this is the last time we shall see each other salomon haydn's manager had planned to bring mozart to england on the older composer's return to the continent to be sure there was other work to be done if in large part trifling but early in january seventeen ninety one mozart completed his last clavier concerto the singularly affecting one in b flat k five ninety five which harks back to earlier models and lacks some of the more original and dramatic elements of the incomparable ones in d minor e flat a major c major and c minor and in june seventeen ninety one on a visit to constanza in baden where she had gone for another cure he wrote for a local choir-master anton stoll that short ave verum motet than which nothing of mozart's is more unutterably seraphic end of part four part five of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart by Howard Peiser. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part V. The Magic Flute. Mozart was ill and despondent, but his activity was untiring. It is an infinite pity that he did not take the hint of De Ponte and others who were urging him to come to England, where he might easily have made a fortune and become a British idol like Handel before him, and Haydn and Mendelssohn after him. He went on writing, because, as he was soon to say, composition tires me less than resting. In the spring of 1791, he was commissioned to compose another opera which was to be his last and in a number of respects his most epic-making the magic flute die sauberflirte 
and with it he was to write one of the most extraordinary works of operatic history to create german opera in accordance with a long-cherished ambition of his but like moses never to do more than cross the frontier of the promised land he had beheld in vision Emanuel Schikander, who had known Wolfgang and Leopold Mozart in Salzburg, was a wandering actor and a playwright of sorts, the head of a travelling company, which gave Shakespeare, Goethe, Schiller, Lessing, and for better or worse, operas by Gluck and Schingspiele, by Haydn and Mozart. He had, like numerous barnstormers, a keen knowledge of the taste of audiences, particularly of the plebeian ones to which his players catered in his own way as adventurous a person as de ponte schikander took over in seventeen eighty nine the direction of a playhouse on the staremberg estates the freihaus theater in the wieden district there he produced comic shows singspiele and operettas with his grasp of suburban tastes he combined a thorough understanding of what could be done with his brother mason and old acquaintance mozart a business rival of the impresario marinelli who ran a theatre in the leopoldstadt quarter and made a specialty of magic plays he now approached the composer with his own singspiel we cannot here examine the sources from which he assembled his libretto there ran through it a powerful strain of masonic influence love interest low comedy in abundance schikander took care to tailor to his own measure the role of the wandering bird-catcher papageno and other sure-fire theatrical ingredients he asked mozart to supply the music and the latter after warning him that since he had never yet written a magic opera he hesitated to court failure in this fear at length complied between march and the end of september seventeen ninety one the magic flute was written schikander aware of the glorious bargain he had struck strove to be the soul of complacence he supplied the composer with every comfort at his disposal a charming summer-house on the grounds of the theatre where he could work at the score with food wine and pretty actresses to divert him in short whatever promised to humour the musician and promote the flow of inspiration he even hummed or sang the sort of tunes he considered appropriate to the role he designed for himself let us at this stage dispose of a few legends that in the course of a hundred and sixty years have accumulated about the work one is that the play is a farrago of childish nonsense made tolerable only by the variety and grandeur of mozart's music another that the plot was altered at a late hour because another manager was about to produce a work similar in its story a third that the piece was a failure as a matter of fact, the book of the Magic Flute happens to be one of the best librettos in existence from the point of view of good theatre. The imagined revision never took place, for considerations of parallels, let alone plagiarisms, never bothered theatre directors at this epoch. On the contrary, if a play or opera had one feature that pleased its public, a rival manager was quick to copy this very point on an even broader scale although at the first performance the magic flute did not achieve such an overwhelming triumph as its composer had hoped before many months had passed it was attracting throngs and not many years later schikander was able to build out of the wealth it brought him that famous theatre on devine which still stands and was to become the cradle of various storied masterworks as for the much maligned book it appeared so powerfully to none other than goethe that he set out to write a sequel while the sick and harried mozart worked with still inexhaustible fertility at the score of his magic opera he was interrupted by a sufficiently distasteful order from prague for an opera to be produced there at the coronation of leopold ii as king of bohemia 
with no more than eighteen days to compose the music and assist in the production of this occasional piece he was ordered to set an old text of metastasios retouched it is true by one catarino mazzola la camenza di tito an antiquated specimen of opera seria such as the composer had not bothered with since the period of idomeneo the available time being so short mozart took along with him his pupil Sussmeyer, who was asked to perform the almost secretarial job of writing the secco recitatives leaving the more important parts of the music to the master his good friend the impresario guadassone mounted the opera in sumptuous fashion but good will did not supplant genuine inspiration and for all its craftsmanship la camenza di tito did not strike fire the empress dismissed it as porcheria tedesca german rubbish a correspondent of studien für tonkunstler und musikfreunde reported that the beloved kapellmeister mozart did not obtain this time the applause he had a right to expect for once clearly his proggers did not understand him doubtless tito is not a figaro or a don giovanni but those unfamiliar with the work may well ask themselves if it is as bad as history paints it anyway its reception did not raise the master's spirit and he took leave of his friends with tears he was now seriously ill he had fainting fits and accesses of exhaustion on september twenty eighth seventeen ninety one he finished the magic flute the march of the priests and the overture being the last number set down the masonic symbols and meanings with which the opera is filled comprehensible however only to initiates are heard in the thrice reiterated three chords at the opening of the superb tone piece the overture is a fully developed sonata movement built on a fugal plan the mercurial subject having been borrowed from a clavier sonata of his old friend and rival clemente at the first performance the composer johann schenk later one of beethoven's teachers crept through the orchestra to mozart who was conducting and reverently kissed his hand while the composer continuing to conduct with his right hand affectionately patted schenk's head with his left he took pleasure in playing the glockenspiel during papageno's air ein mädchen oder weibchen and once in fun introduced an unexpected arpeggio which threw schikander completely out for a few minutes the requiem as he was boarding his coach on the trip to prague mozart was startled on being accosted by a gaunt grey-clad stranger of mysterious mien who asked him if he were willing to undertake for a certain sum the composition of a requiem mass to be delivered at a specified time he agreed but from this moment the weird visitor whose identity he was admonished not to try to discover gave him no rest he became convinced that a messenger from the beyond had sought him out that the incident had a supernatural aspect that he was indeed ordered by a higher power to compose a death mass for himself and the certainty that his time was at hand grew steadily upon him the incident in reality had nothing macabre or mysterious about it the grey messenger was a certain leutgeb steward of the count valseg zu stupak who had lately lost his wife and who aspiring to be known as a composer planned to perform the requiem as his own work but mozart knew nothing of this he had a letter from his old friend da ponte entreating him to join him in england but it was too late and mozart's tragedy had to be played out to the bitter close that was now swiftly approaching to da ponte he dispatched this pathetic missive i wish i could follow your advice but how can i do so i feel stunned i reason with difficulty and cannot rid myself of the vision of this unknown man i see him perpetually he entreats me he presses me he impatiently demands the work i go on writing 
otherwise i have nothing more to fear i know from what i suffer that the hour is come i am at the point of death i have come to the end before having had the enjoyment of my talent life was so beautiful my career stood at first under so auspicious a star but one cannot change one's destiny what tortured him more than anything was the thought that as furiously as he worked the requiem might remain unfinished at the death he knew was imminent he had numerous discussions with his pupil xavier zusmeyer but it was daily becoming clearer to him that he had small chance of completing the mass himself on a walk in the prator with constanza in the early autumn he exclaimed it cannot last much longer certainly i have been given poison that is a feeling i cannot shake off and this presumably is the basis of the age-old slander that salieri had been his murderer at all events growing weakness forced him to take to his bed on november twenty he was never to leave it i know he had said shortly before that my music-making is about at an end i feel a constant chill which i cannot explain i now have no more to do save with doctors and apothecaries his hands and feet were beginning to swell yet he struggled desperately to get on with the composition of the mass the visits of a few friends seemed to comfort the sick man and he asked them to try over in his presence certain completed pages of the score at the beginning of december he himself struggled to sing some of the alto part of the work when the lacrimosa was reached he gave up the attempt after a few measures and overcome by the certainty that he was doomed never to finish the music he broke down in a fit of weeping and in these days with tragic irony there dawned a promise of better things the rapidly growing popularity of the magic flute augured a carefree future a group of hungarian nobles began to raise a subscription that would have assured mozart an annual income of a thousand gulden and from holland there came almost at the twelfth hour news of an even more gratifying project mozart's death in the last hours his sister-in-law sophie havel lent what assistance she could constanza grief-stricken and stupefied was helpless the sick man tortured to the last by the thought of his unfinished requiem was shaken by the chills and fires of fever it was found necessary to take a canary out of the sick-room because the singing of the bird seemed to cause the sufferer physical pain he appealed to sophie to remain with him to comfort constanza and to see me die i have the taste of death on my tongue already and who is to care for my constanza when i am gone a doctor who attended him was at the theatre when summoned and realizing the hopelessness of the case promised to come when the play was over sophie was dispatched to call a priest when she returned she found the dying man bending over some sketches of the requiem and giving susmeyer some final directions about the work at last he lapsed into unconsciousness a few moments before the end puffing out his cheeks and making what the tearful bystanders imagined to be an effort to imitate the sound of the drums in his unfinished score and five minutes before one on the morning of december five seventeen ninety one he died of what illness did mozart die typhus some say a result of childhood illness say others complicated by the strain of overwork travelling disappointments and deprivations the most plausible medical explanation would appear to have been supplied by a modern salzburg physician dr h kasseroller who diagnosed the cause of the master's early demise as uremia resulting from bright's disease and this may explain the composer's persistent idea in his last weeks that he had been administered poison the rest of the pitiful story need not detain us the parsimonious baron von schwieten advised constanza to observe economy in making the funeral arrangements and so mozart was buried in a pauper's grave 
on december sixth the body was taken to the cemetery of st mark's a handful of mourners who followed the hearse dispersed when a heavy snowstorm made progress difficult the stricken constanza found it impossible to accompany the pathetic little cortege and when some time later she attempted to discover her husband's resting-place a new grave-digger who replaced the earlier one had no idea whatever where he lay what matter that posterity has never discovered the whereabouts of his sepulchre mozart the incessant wanderer the infinitely lonely now lives more fully and gloriously than ever in the hearts and souls of all true worshippers of the divinest in music and if his earthly tragedy has never seemed so poignant as it does to-day we can take consolation from the circumstance that our generation has learned to prize the greatness elevation and beauty of his art more perhaps than did any of our predecessors end of part five end of wolfgang amadeus mozart by howard peiser